Um, oh, your slides are blank now. Is that deliberate? Ah, it's deliberate. <laughs> No, I don't think it was. I I just don't know how to work teams that well. Um, but I think when I go back to the slideshow, it shows up for everyone. So OK, no, that's great. Um, so we just give people about two or three more minutes. We've got 15 people so far. Uh, people are sometimes coming from other classes or things like that. So we just. Um, uh, Give it another two minutes or so, then we'll get going. Um, Tebocheng, um, I'll ask if you'll introduce people after I've just provided the sort of uh, introduction to the speakers, if that's OK. That's fine, Marisa. Thank you very much. OK, I think we should get going now. And um, I'd really like to give a warm welcome to our two visitors from the United States. Um, that's Bo Isadi from Eastern Washington University, which I presume is on the West Coast, despite its name. <laughs> and um, uh, it's very nice to have you here. <coughs> and um, and to Julie Luft, who is uh, a long term colleague and working with me on many things, including the Samsky Research School. Uh, and uh, I happened to spot this article that they wrote in the Journal of Research and Science Teaching. And it looked like something that would be very interesting for our colleagues here at the University of Pretoria. So I'm so glad that you agreed to uh, to give this talk just to say um, Bo is an assistant professor of biology education at Eastern Washington University. He, funnily enough, has a PhD from University of Georgia. I wonder where that connection came from. And um, he uh, focuses on evidence-based practices in undergraduate STEM courses and also on teacher preparation. But I think what we're talking about today is the undergraduate STEM courses. Am I right? And yes. Julie, uh, I um, Julie has actually been to Mamelodi once, I think before the pandemic, and she gave a very nice workshop to the biology people. And it will be very nice one day to get her back again. So she's not a stranger to UP. And she's done a lot of work on first year teachers, but she's also done work on undergraduate teaching which is the subject of today's talk. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask Ntebuching, the director of the Mamelodi campus, to uh, welcome them, and then we'll launch straight into it. Thank you, Marissa. And uh, thank you very much to both Bo and uh, Judy for agreeing to share with us some insights from your, um, from your study. Uh, we can learn a, a thing or two, and I'm quite glad to hear that uh, Judy was once at Mamelodi campus, and we hope that we can have you both here at Mamelodi campus uh, sometime in the near future. Um, just to say that this is part of our uh, seminars here that we, we lost you for a minute there. Eh? Uh, I think we've lost connection with um, uh, with Ntebocheng. We have this wonderful thing in South Africa called load shedding. Uh, 
so she's probably a victim. We'll just give her a minute or two to see if she goes out and comes back in again. Are you back with us in Tebuche? I think she's coming and going. Okay, I think what we do is we go straight ahead and um, I'll ask her to say something perhaps at the end of the talk. Um, and uh, ah, Julie's in on her computer now. And um, that means she can actually do things with the slides. And um, I'm going to put a chat to Table King to say we'll carry on. And uh, so let's go ahead. I don't know how you two are playing it, who's starting, who's carrying on. And um, so it looks like Bo's unmuted. So I'd say Bo, go ahead. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rolnick. Um, and, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to be here and share our work on the relationships between undergraduate instructors' conceptions of how students learn and their instructional practices. Um, and so we approached this study um, after thinking about active learning, uh, what that means. Uh, it's, a, it's a very broad term uh, when instructors stop lecturing for some to most of the class periods, giving students time to solve problems, uh, use their prior knowledge, think about um, their understandings and interact with both each other, the instructor and the material. Um, and there was a, a large meta-analysis by Scott Freeman et al. Um, that showed that active learning um, increases exam scores and decreases failure rates. Um, despite that, um, a large portion of STEM faculty in the United States still primarily use extensive lecturing. Um, there's less active learning in STEM classrooms um, than in non-STEM classrooms. And so this raised the question, we've, we've had these advancements in our understanding of uh, how students learn. We've had a uh, significant amount of evidence come out to support active learning, yet um, we still really rely on lecture in our STEM classes. Um, and so it raised the question, um, if, if this evidence isn't influencing our instruction, what is? Um, and so we really started looking more at that. Um, and, and the purpose of this study was to understand the relationship between some of the factors that influence instruction um, and the practices that faculty use. Um, here we're focusing on conceptions of how students learn, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we arrived at, at that in a minute. Um, and when we talk about conceptions um, in this study, we're referring to faculty members' mental processes, their knowledge. Uh, we didn't try to disentangle knowledge and beliefs in this study, but anything that the faculty were thinking about how students learn, we wanted to understand that and understand how it could influence their instruction. We asked three primary research questions. First, in what ways do STEM faculty members conceptualize how students learn? What instructional practices do STEM faculty members implement in their courses? And then our primary question, how do STEM faculty members' conceptions of how students learn relate to their instructional practices? A theoretical framework that guided the study um, as we were thinking about what influences instruction, the teacher-centered systematic reform model, I guess Newsom et al, um, proposed three main factors. Um, first in the center is teacher thinking, and that's um, instructors' knowledge and beliefs, or what we've called conceptions here, about teaching and learning. Um, Two other primary factors influencing instruction are personal factors. Those include things like the instructor's demographics, experience, their preparation, professional development, and contextual factors. Um, things about the class size, the classroom layout, um, up to the department, university, and even the field itself. So this is what we use to start exploring these questions. Um, we looked at related literature. Um, the the teacher-centered systematic reform model is emergent still, was developed and tested primarily with case studies. Um, there was a recent large-scale confirmatory study, um, but it used self-report data. And so there's still um, some, some emergent areas here where there seem to be some large trends, but it's, it's still under-tested. 
Moving into some background literature on instructors' conceptions, most of this literature focuses on conceptions of teaching and not learning. So we were really interested in how do faculty think students learn and are they providing opportunities for those learning experiences in their class? Um, studies have shown that there are um, some differences between faculty conceptions of teaching and learning. Northcote found that um, conceptions of teaching were more idealistic and conceptions of learning were more realistic. Um, and then other studies have found that faculty members have held um, undergraduate STEM faculty members in particular have had limited knowledge of student learning and limited training and preparation in this area. Um, studies often have used deductive approaches, so they've coded um, interviews or survey data using uh, specific learning theories and based on the time of the article potentially outdated since we've um, you know, learned a lot more about how students learn um, in the last 30 50 years. Studies rarely observe instruction when they're looking at instructors conceptions of teaching and learning um, and, and so that as Keynes says um, relies on a spouse teacher thinking um, sometimes we can see conceptions of teaching and learning in practice that we can't um, readily discuss in an interview. Um, conceptions can be described on a continuum ranging from teacher centered to student centered. Um, so we'll talk more about that continuum later today. Um, and previous studies have found that instructors who hold strong beliefs about the importance of lecturing, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, lecture more in class. So students spend more time listening and less time working and vice versa. And so it's been a, a sort of a um, um, correlation between um, beliefs and practices and, and previous studies. So we wanted to examine that more closely um, and in particular rely less on self-report data to examine that relationship. And then finally, that conceptions are largely influenced by instructors prior experiences as both instructors and their experiences as students. Um, so a lot of faculty um, since STEM in the United States has, has primarily been taught through extensive lecture and faculty were successful in that setting um, will continue to teach through extensive lecture. <laughs> and now moving into some literature on STEM instructional practices. Again, extensive lecturing widespread. Um, most instruction, a recent study that used cluster analysis found that most instruction can be classified as either traditional lecture or active learning. There's two main groups of, of how we teach STEM. Um, and that some common barriers to instructional change include the lack of time, training, and incentives. Those are the, the three largest barriers. There's um, quite a few more um, that affect faculty though. Moving into our study and the methods we use, we used a multiple methods approach, um, qualitative methods, including interviews, using interpretive traditions to um, elicit and describe the conceptions that faculty members had about how students learn, and then quantitative approaches to look at classroom observation data and the relationship between the conceptions and the practices that faculty use. So we'll walk through that a little more. To give you some context of this study, uh, this occurred at a large research university in the southeastern United States. Uh, this institution had several initiatives going on to reduce class sizes, improve facilities, and promote active learning. So here you can see a brand new building that was built, the Science Learning Center. That was a um, instructional building that had lots of teaching labs, uh, la uh, large active learning lecture halls where uh, two rows were on the same tier. It was sort of a tiered room, so students could turn around and work in groups, even though they're in a large room. Um, scale up classrooms with these round tables with computers that students could work in groups as well, um, surrounded by whiteboards. Um, so, so some structural um, initiatives. There were also professional development programs going on that I'll, I'll mention in just a second. We had 22 participants in the study, uh, seven female, uh, 15 male, a range of STEM disciplines from life science to math, technology, engineering, a range of experience with the faculty um, from one year of teaching experience up to 27 in a range of positions. We had two postdocs, full professors, former department heads, and, and everywhere in between. And then those 
professional development programs going on. Um, in each of these programs, we recruited three to six participants. So one program was the scale up learning community that supported faculty learning how to teach, um, how to implement best practices in these scale up classrooms. Another group was experienced novice instructor pairings where a novice instructor was paired with an uh, experienced instructor to mentor them in teaching and learning. In another program, uh, faculty were uh, provided peer learning assistants, which are essentially undergraduate teaching assistants, uh, former students who were successful in the class who could help the instructor um, either facilitate group discussions, grade papers, give feedback, etc. And so this program helped faculty again implement best practices using peer learning assistants. And then finally, a department based initiative, a math department um, that sort of a bottom up approach where they decided to meet and discuss um, teaching and learning and how to improve their courses as a department. And so again, we had three to six participants from each of these groups. We also recruited three participants who were not in any professional development to um, increase the range of participants in our study. So there's five groups total. Um, that we think represents a wide range of faculty at the institution. We collected two interviews, one before the semester started and one after the semester, and we did three classroom observations spread throughout the semester. The interviews were semi-structured, lasted about 30 to 60 minutes, and to give you an idea of some of the questions we asked, how do students learn in your class? Can you describe the relationship between your teaching and student learning? Um, how do experts learn in your field? What characterizes knowledge in your field to get at faculty conceptions of learning, knowledge, and teaching? Um, each of these had probing questions, um, and that second interview largely was based off the responses of the first and some of the observations that we made. On the observation side, we used the classroom observation protocol for undergraduate STEM, the COPUS, um, and here's a, a screenshot of part of that protocol. Um, this protocol captures student and instructor behaviors in two minute windows. And so here we can see the list of student codes and I'll just uh, give you a sense of what some of those are. Uh, students listening to lecture, uh, doing either individual or group work, answering questions, asking questions, uh, so on and so forth. And similarly, um, it codes what the instructors are doing, lecturing, posing questions, asking questions, moving, guiding one on one with instructors. We focused primarily on what the students were doing in class, and we compared that to what faculty described students should be learning from um, from their interviews. And so to walk you through the data analysis of the interviews first, we use a two cycle coding structure uh, where first we started with structural codes to identify relevant text to the interview or to the research questions. Um, then we used in vivo coding to maintain participants own words. Uh, we wanted to develop codes using their language uh, to capture the essence of what they were saying about teaching and learning. We then created a conceptually clustered matrix to sort codes. Each code was categorized as student centered or teacher centered using a framework from Simmons et al. And then we calculated the degree of student centeredness to teacher centeredness. So to give you a hypothetical here, if uh, an interview had 20 codes total and 15 were student centered, five were teacher centered, we'd calculate that degree of student centeredness as 75%. Moving into the analysis of the observations, um, COPUS codes are often grouped into these clusters. Um, and so one cluster that we focused on was students receiving information either through a lecture or a video. Um, and then another cluster that we focused on was students working when students are either working individually or in groups. And we calculated the prevalence of those clusters. So to give you another hypothetical, a lot of classes here are 50 minutes. <coughs> Sorry. And so let's say in one class, uh, students received information in five of the 25 two minute windows. Uh, we'd calculate the prevalence there as 20% of the observation windows. And so we then averaged, since we had three observations, we averaged the prevalence of the codes across the three observations to compare to the interview data. And how we did that was a hierarchical cluster analysis to identify different patterns in the 
that degree of student centeredness from the interview data and those two student clusters, students listening, receiving information and students working. And through that analysis, we identified three groups that I'll talk about a little later on. Through each of these steps, we use multiple coders to increase the validity and reliability, um, examine uh, our codes to discuss the adequacy of the codes, revise codes if needed, um, and have discussions to reach consensus on the codes. Uh, we looked for disconfirming evidence to, especially when going from qualitative data to quantitative, to ensure that quantitative analysis um, reflected the, the qualitative data that we uh, observed. Some limitations before we jump into the results. Um, most of the participants were in PD programs that potentially leads to selection bias. Um, and so when I present um, our results, the, the faculty in the different groups are not necessarily reflective or representative of the number of faculty in each different group, just that the different groups that exist that faculty might be in. Uh, the second limitation, quantifying, as I, I just alluded to, um, quantifying instructors' conceptions into a quantitative number uh, certainly risks oversimplifying that qualitative data, um, and that's where those checks back to um, the qualitative data was, was very important afterwards um, to make sure that number really reflected uh, the qualitative work. And then finally, the duration of the study was only one semester, so um, it's not a longitudinal study. We did not measure changes in conceptions or practices. Um, while that might be nice to answer some, some future questions. So uh, three main results from this work. Uh, first, faculty members have a range of espoused conceptions of how students learn, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there was a large range in faculty members' instructional practices and in two main groups. Um, as a recent cluster analysis found, and then three clusters of faculty with varying relationships between their conceptions and practices. And that's where we'll spend most of our time. Um, to give you first, though, a sense of the range of conceptions faculty have, they really spanned this continuum that other studies have proposed um, from exclusively teacher-centered conceptions to exclusively student-centered conceptions, uh, with most faculty somewhere in the middle of that continuum. Um, one participant on the teacher-centered side of this um, described students learning only through lectures or reading. Um, this participant, uh, because of that, had a degree of student-centeredness of zero. Um, and one quote from their interview, I would say that they learned through actively listening, paying attention, absorbing information. On the other side, we had three participants that only describes students learning through active learning activities, such as working problems. They had a degree of student centeredness of one. Some examples uh, from their interviews of the ways that students learn, students have to work problems. It's much less about reading the textbooks as it is about practical problem solving, spending time doing that. Um, there were quite a few other faculty who had um, degrees of student centeredness up above 0.7 all the way in the to the 90 percent there, uh, but the bulk of the faculty were in the middle of the continuum. Uh, example quote here from a participant that has a mix of both passive and active um, activities. Solve as many problems as possible. Ask questions if possible. Form groups with other students. Show up for lectures, obviously. If possible, taking good notes. Read the textbook. Compare notes to the textbook. So both. Um, learning through lecture, through textbooks, and active learning activities. Moving into their instructional practices, uh, we also found a bimodal distribution in the instructional practices faculty used. We had one group that had, uh, here we have receiving information or essentially students listening to a lecture on the y-axis and working on the x-axis here. So each of these dots is uh, the average of one instructor. Um, and so here we have a cluster of faculty who had high levels of student listening in their classes and another group of instructors who had lower levels of student listening, averaging about 45% with this group. So we either had about 90% student listening or 45% student listening. And then on the working uh, side, we had a group that had an average of about 19% student working in their class, and the other group had an average of about 62% of their class students were working. And so these were inversely related to each other. The more time spent 
listening to lecture, the less time spent working. And then finally, moving into our main finding, the relationships between conceptions and practices. And this is where the cluster analysis helped us identify three different patterns and the ways that instructors' conceptions, which is going to be on the x-axis here, and that degree of student-centeredness, again, zero being entirely teacher-centered, learning through lectures and textbook, and one being um, entirely student-centered, where students, uh, the, the instructors only describe that students learn through active learning activities on the x-axis. And here we have the prevalence of student listening on the y-axis, so closer to one is entirely lecture, entirely listening to lecture during class, and zero would be just working problems in class. And so here you can see those three clusters, and we'll walk through each um, in the next few slides. Uh, just to show you the other side of this student working on the y-axis now, we can see the inverse of that. Since listening and working were inversely related, here the more time um, we, we see uh, one in this case being more time spent working in class and zero being less time spent working. And when they weren't working in class, they were listening to lecture primarily. So those three clusters, um, here we can see cluster one, which is this group of five faculty. And the large uh, icons in each cluster are the average of those faculty in this group. So five faculty in cluster one um, that we called the congruent lectures. And so they had lower degrees of student centeredness and lower prevalence of student working, higher prevalence of student listening. Uh, cluster two, uh, we called congruent active learning facilitators. They implemented quite a bit of active learning in their class. And then three is incongruent lectures, faculty who held student centered views of learning, but implemented uh, extensive lecture in their classrooms. So uh, walking through each of these and giving you an example of a representative case member in each cluster. Uh, one, again, a strong alignment between teacher centered conceptions and traditional lecture based instruction. Um, these participants, um, three of the five participants here, um, we might be able to see them down here, although it's a little small, did have um, several statements about students learning through activities, not just lecture um, or reading the textbook, but all of those occurred outside of the classroom for these faculty members. They described um, this being through homework or in the lab. So here's a quote uh, sort of summarizing that. Some of the uh, concepts that they are exposed to through lectures and through the textbook, they get a chance to actually actively engage with through labs that are required as part of the course. Um, other faculty described this as um, homework uh, that students learn through forming study groups outside of class. In class, they learn through lecture and outside of class is where the, the active learning came in for these faculty. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a little while. Um, Results, um, an, an example case from this cluster one group of faculty is Stephen, a student uh, assistant professor in a life science discipline teaching a large 300 student course at 15 to 20 years experience. Students listened in 96% of the two minute windows we observed and worked during 10%. Stephen expressed that students learn through actively listening, paying attention and absorbing information. Stephen was skeptical of the benefits of active learning for students, especially in his discipline, where he felt students really needed to memorize a lot of content and that lecture was best for that. Um, he thought that learning should be a continuous process that's always expanding or moving forward. Um, this sounded a lot like constructivism, um, but was implemented a little different. He didn't elicit or use students prior knowledge to inform his instruction. Um, he viewed learning as this accumulation of facts where each grade prepared students to learn more information in the next grade. Um, so whichever course um, came before Stevens course, um, he felt that students would all get a similar level of understanding through that course and that um, he could then uh, move forward with the next course. He didn't need to elicit students uh, understanding in his course. Moving into cluster two, this was the group of congruent active learning facilitators. There was again alignment between their student centered conceptions in this case and active learning instructional practices that we observed in their classrooms. 
Um, students worked in over 50% of the two minute windows and listened in less than 60% of the two minute windows in this group. And unlike cluster one, uh, faculty explicitly described that students learned through activities during class. So one instructor stated, uh, students learn by doing math, not by watching an instructor do math. OK, so uh, example case in cluster two, Susan, an associate professor in a technology discipline. Uh, she was teaching an introductory course with approximately 75 students. She was using the flipped classroom format for the first time um, in this course. Uh, taught in a scale up classroom, students listened during 42% of the student windows and, or the uh, observation windows and worked during 60% of the observation windows. <coughs> Susan stated that different people learn differently um, and described essentially um, something that sounded uh, similar to learning styles where she described visual learners, auditory learners, um, trying to implement graphs and figures in her slides when she did lecture. Um, she says that students retain more information uh, when they teach themselves either individually in groups rather than her feeding them information. And she also described that she can't teach without feedback from students. Um, that when students either don't ask questions or don't answer her questions in class, it's a very difficult one way street, as she called it. Um, the implementation of this flipped classroom was very difficult for her. It was more work than she realized. Um, she got pretty burnt out, got sick um, during this course. She was also teaching more students than usual. She had 140 students across two classes. We observed one of them in this semester. Um, she normally has 80 students, so um, a larger workload and, and implementing um, this flipped classroom for the first time was, was quite difficult for her. And then moving into cluster three, this is um, perhaps the most interesting case, um, the incongruent lectures. So in those large self-report studies, um, it showed largely that uh, you know, conceptions and practices were correlated with each other. And here, this is a group um, that where there's a misalignment between those conceptions and what we observed during the classroom observations um, when these faculty were using traditional extensive lecture-based instruction. Unlike instructors in cluster one who also primarily lectured. Many of these participants explicitly stated that students should be doing active learning activities in the classroom. So this was a, a another large difference between cluster one and cluster three. <clears throat> For example, students don't learn by watching me solve something or following along in lecture and saying I see what you did there. The students need to do it themselves. And so a representative case in cluster three is Evan, a lecturer in life science department. Um, less than five years teaching experience at the university taught a large another 300 person or so uh, class in a large auditorium. Students listened during 92 percent of the two minute windows and worked during 14 percent of the two minute windows. Evan described that students learned through completing assignments, quizzes, discussion boards which occur outside of class. Um, he said revelation happens in the classroom, but learning happens outside of the classroom when students are really thinking about the information. He described that students learn best when confronted with their lack of knowledge, um, and he described that this is uncomfortable for the students. He likes to create these uncomfortable situations in class where students are confronted with misconceptions. Um, at the same time, he recognized that he was most comfortable. He's as this bottom quote says, I've taught myself to teach as a pure lecture, and there's a huge disconnect between that and what I know the research says about students, the way that students learn best. It's not from listening to lecture, so I know there's a big gigantic disconnect between those two. And so sort of connecting these two bottom quotes, he knows that students learn best when they're uncomfortable, when they're confronted with their lack of knowledge, yet he's most comfortable lecturing. Um, and so he recognized um, you know, sort of that hypocrisy between wanting his students to be uncomfortable when they're learning, but not being willing to be uncomfortable himself and, and use active learning. And he said that's something he wants to um, you know, be more uncomfortable with um, by using more active learning. Some of the reasons for misalignment that faculty described in their interviews <coughs> included personal and contextual factors. So some personal factors, faculty mentioned the time to prepare activities, the lack of knowledge or training that they had on active learning, 
not relating well to students, teaching a course for the first time, a personal preference to lecture, and previous negative experiences using active learning. So one quote on this, I wanna insert more active learning activities into the course in a seamless and meaningful manner. Because you know, I certainly can take 10 minutes out and say I want you to do this, but that's sort of just inserting it. Instead, what I'd like to do is develop a pacing where it goes in exactly where it's needed. And quite frankly, I don't think that's gonna happen and it probably won't happen um, next semester, but maybe two years down the road, the product will really flow well. Um, and so this time, he, he really wants this to be a seamless transition. He wants to implement active learning in the right spot, and he's not sure where that should be at this time. Contextual factors, um, class size, classroom layout, availability of teaching assistants, classroom location. Uh, their teaching class was far away from where they were housed, so carrying materials was very difficult. The need to cover content, we'll have a quote about that course sequencing, number of sections, and student evaluations. So here, instructor said, I always feel like there's content that has to be covered. That content tyranny is very real in my subfield specifically. We have faculty of three people, so you sort of feel like you can't do too much just completely on your own because somebody else is teaching the same class and you've got to sort of keep up with the material. So it's my dream to almost completely convert it into a student-oriented course. It's just a rich field and it's a shame to me that we spend so much time just lecturing. So now moving into some discussion on these results. Our first research question, how does STEM faculty conceptualize student learning? We had a mix of conceptions that spanned the continuum. Um, you know, one interesting finding from this cluster one faculty describing that active learning happens outside of the classroom in laboratory settings, study groups are at home. Uh, where many of the, the activities that cluster two and three faculty described were in the classroom. And so one thing that may be going on with cluster one faculty is they might think they're sufficiently supporting students um, through active learning by using these out of class assignments. Uh, when, when the literature uh, is defining active learning as what's happening in the classroom. So there may be a disconnect there between the ways faculty are thinking about active learning and, and how the literature is um, defining active learning. Um, in our second research question, instructional practices, uh, faculty members again either extensively lectured or implemented a substantial number of student-centered activities, um, largely aligning with previous studies here. And then moving into the main research question, the, the relationship between those two, those three clusters of faculty that emerged through the analysis. Um, some findings there, all instructors who implemented student-centered practices, so that would be these faculty up here who implemented a large number of student-centered practices. All of those held student-centered conceptions down here on the x-axis. Um, that suggests that student-centered conceptions may be necessary for faculty to implement active learning, um, but because some faculty still extensively lecture, even though they, they express very strongly that students should learn through activities, uh, those student-centered conceptions are not sufficient for faculty to implement active learning. So that certainly has some implications for how we provide professional development to faculty. Personal and contextual factors were barriers that potentially caused that misalignment. Um, and suggests that you know professional development shouldn't just focus on teacher thinking, um, you know, providing um, support for faculty to develop their understanding of teaching and learning, or just providing curriculum. Uh, we also have to address these personal and contextual factors for faculty to be successful in implementing those practices. And so uh, there were some implications. We have some you know, potential revisions we want to test for this uh, teacher-centered systematic reform model. Our results suggest that the closer in proximity contextual factors are to the classroom and the instructor, the larger the influence they have on this relationship. And so moving from um, this figure up here in the top right to Something that hopefully you know resembles a layered diagram, maybe like an onion or something, uh, where we have instructional practices in the middle, most largely influenced by teacher thinking and then personal factors, and then contextual factors as they move from the classroom up to the department level, the university, and even the discipline. Um, and then finally, some implications. Um, again, faculty PD should address each component of this model, not just teacher thinking. <coughs> This might explain some of the findings 
um, on you know, literature reviews in the in the professional development literature where uh, we find that these one time one size fits all workshops um, are largely ineffective as well as efforts to just disseminate curriculum. Um, Henderson has a nice literature review showing that. Um, also, the diversity of instructors' conceptions, practices, and those three clusters suggest the importance of individualized professional development. Um, so faculty in cluster one likely need a very different professional development program than faculty in cluster two and in faculty in cluster three. And then that departments and institutions play an important role in these reform efforts, those uh, especially those contextual factors, um, efforts to reduce class size, uh, providing the availability of TAs, um, rethinking how we evaluate faculty um, and lectures for um, retention, promotion, and tenure. Um, if student evaluations, uh, if we anticipate those might go down, if we change the format of our class, that's certainly a barrier as well. Some future research building off of this, um, looking at the interactions between these factors as faculty member adopt active learning. So looking at how <clears throat> Personal factors, for example, might change as our understanding or our conceptions or teacher thinking changes, um, looking at those interactions more closely over time through longitudinal studies. And then also looking at um, the ways in which faculty members are specifically using their conceptions to inform their practices, um, looking at the day to day, how do we plan, um, implement, and then evaluate our instruction using our conceptions of how students learn. Some acknowledgments, uh, certainly the faculty participants for letting us into their classrooms, giving us time to talk with them about teaching and learning, uh, the research team pictured here, um, and then Eastern Washington University of Georgia uh, and the NSF for their support. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to any questions. That's great, uh, Bob. Um You've actually given us a little bit about four or five minutes extra for discussion, which is good timing, I think. Uh, I found it personally very interesting, and I'd really love to get my hands on some of those instruments. But um, Tebuchang uh, said her, the internet went down on the Mamelodi campus, which is really quite bad, considering they're hosting the talk. But we still have 17 people in the room, so... I think there is still quite a lot of interest. So, and she's trying to get back in, but um, so I think we'll have to carry on without her. Um, anybody like to ask some questions uh, from Bo about the work? Uh, either uh, oh, there's a question from Mariki Potrita in the chat. Um, so what she's asking is, did you find that a specific discipline is inclined to require or induce a particular teaching practice? For example, that biology is... Hang on, I'm just uh, attend to one of the... One of the uh, uh, mics is on. Oh, it's off now. Sorry. Uh, Hang on. I'll just mute. Oh, it's, it's muted now. OK, let me carry on with that question. Um, for example, that biology is more typically taught in lecture style, while maths is more likely to be taught uh, with students working in class. Uh, I have to say that I ma majored in maths, and my exam my understand my experience was the reverse. Um, I found when I did maths, I only understood about three weeks later what it was all about. <laughs> so, um, but I'll leave that to you answer how it looked between disciplines. You want okay, to can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK, um, yeah, and Julie, you can uh, jump in on this too. Um, that was certainly something that we looked at, not in this paper, but in a different part of the research. Um, and so Julie may have a better answer to this than I do. I'll turn <laughs> it over to her off. and then I'll, I'll jump back in afterwards. 
That's very funny. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Okay, great. I'm using a different type of set of headphones. It's so lovely to uh, see little icons of everybody. Um, so we were interested in this, and I think what we found, we did some preliminary work into it, and not by the disciplines of uh, math has so much into the sciences, but among the sciences, we found some differences. So, but I mean, I'm not sure just how strong they held, but we did find, and, and Bo, I, I was looking for that data really quickly, and maybe you have it too, but I think our biology people were more active learning centered, if I remember right. And then the physics disciplines were more, uh, were um, more traditionally oriented. And then the chemistry people were more kind of in the middle. So there were some disciplinary pieces. We have it some, and I and I think that was. Do you remember that? That's what I remember. So then I'll I'll turn it back over to Bo. This is like a conversation between he and I of stuff that happened years ago. <laughs> yeah. So can you um, see a table now? Hopefully that's yes, screen yes, share. Yes, we can. And it looks like it comes out of the journal article. Yes, and so um, in this one, um, we don't have we don't have like a quantitative analysis in this paper on this, but we do have the discipline of each participant, and then we have the prevalence of receiving and working over here. Um, and so this is uh, sorted um, by degree of student centeredness. So uh, these that are listed first are faculty who had very teacher centered um, conceptions. And we can see that sort of life science, just to, to use them as an example here, it's sort of all throughout. So faculty members, their conceptions, um, I don't think we saw a very strong trend on that by discipline. Um, but then if you look at prevalence of receiving, um, you know, some of those here, we have two physical science that are right next to each other. That's maybe a good comparison here, 90%, 35%. So that varied quite a bit even within that discipline. Um, math in our study, I do think we had um, most of the mathematicians. Actually, there's a it's a pretty even split. So here's 88% receiving 40, and then there's two up here, 92% listening to lecture, and 41%. So um, you know some some variation within the disciplines, and I'm I'm not confident about across the disciplines because of that that large variation within each discipline. No, that's that's really interesting. Uh, anybody else like to ask a question? Uh, either about the methodology or the results or how it relates to your own experience. Um, oh, here we have a hand. Um, Again, Mariki Porkita, follow up. Would you like to unmute and talk, Mariki? Um, thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you very yes, well. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so if there's no other question immediately, maybe I can just follow up and say that I'm, I'm intrigued by the fact that your discipline-related context is your outer onion layer, uh, that, that you find that to have the least influence on, on practice. Uh, would you like to say something about that? Oh, you better unmute. Yep, that's a that's a good call. Um, let me try to share that slide again. Um, here we go. Um, and so, yeah, by discipline here, we mean um, like the the broad field. Um, and so, in particular, like in life science, um, there's a, a report, Vision and Change, that some of you may be familiar with. It's from the United States, but um, it largely called out, you know, um, the large discipline. Um, core ideas in in life science and the ways in which um, you know the the biology education researchers um, biologists called for those to be taught more through active learning and um, I think a lot of hope was that that report might spur a lot of change um, but it was on on such a large disciplinary level um, that a lot of biology instructors perhaps haven't heard of vision and change and so it's um, you know, sort of far removed from their context. Um, perhaps on the other side of that, um, a counterpoint might be um, something like anatomy and physiology. Um, 
where the discipline itself is is very focused as some of those quotes might have alluded to um, that there's a lot of facts that need to be memorized and so that's something that um, you know might cross some of these contextual levels that's somewhat of a departmental context structure um, i think in my mind um, where the department is setting the curriculum of these courses and these sequences but certainly that spans disciplines um, where it might be a perceived pressure from medical schools or other um, sort of the discipline in general that we have to cover um, all of this material in these courses and so we don't have the flexibility or the freedom to teach them through an active learning format um, so some of those uh, it's certainly a good question and, and tricky how to um, sort of characterize some of these contextual factors um, some of them may span boxes if if that adds some complexity to the to the figure and it's a great question julie did you have anything to add on that no, no, I don't. I think that that is a good question. But I do, I did find the analysis we did by groups, by disciplines. If you want to go back to that, I actually have two slides on that. Not to change the subject. I don't. I think you're fine, Bo. <laughs> so, but Marissa, else? if you'd like, uh, anybody else like to ask a question? I see. You think there's something in the chat? Just hang on. Oh, that's just thank you from Mariki. Um, Marissa, I'm, I'm happy to share that slide if you want to see it about that. Yes. We did actually look at it and we had a, just yeah, to go, go back, we, we, we had an undergraduate researcher who worked with us for one semester funded by the National Science Foundation, Tarian, and yes. he became really interested in this question. So we did a Kruskal Wallace analysis by discipline. And so let me see if I can pull up these slides for you. Well, that's quite amazing that you can. You must have a a treasure trove in your computer. I don't know if I'd call it a treasure trove. You're and you're going to be asking a miracle if I can get this to work. Um, uh, there's a little. Um, there's a next to the word leave. There's something that says share. I'm looking. Yeah, I see it and. Um, keypad, turn off. Hold on. I wonder why it's not letting me do. Oh, here we here we go. Okay. Well, let me do this. It's going to be a little more. Oh, I see. Let's see. Is that it? It's a little more complicated, and I'm sorry. This is my experience with this website. So I am a total novice. This is not working. But let me get, I'll go back to the results and I can report them out. I'm sorry that I, we actually have some nice figures, but what we showed was that, um, so there was a significant difference in mathematics faculty wanted students to work problems and biology faculty were more focused on providing information. So my misunderstanding of that, my reporting of that was incorrect. They definitely had some significant differences. And in terms of student speaking, it turned out that the mathematics and physics students often, I don't know why we had it this way, they shared more, it was the mathematics and physics students who shared more about how they were thinking about things and talking about to each other about how they were solving problems than the chemistry, the computer science or biology students. So I really misspoke. It was our mathematics and physics students who were um, having more opportunities to engage at significant levels than the other fields. Um, well, thanks very much for that. Um, any other questions people would like to bring up? We've just got a few more minutes now. Um, I was interested, uh, did you ever report this back to the, um, to the people themselves? who were involved in the study, the findings, and what was their reaction? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so what we did at the end of the semester is we provided each faculty member with um, basically a one pager of their results and um, of the observation data in particular. So we didn't report back um, data from the interviews, but we did from the observation. So we gave them a summary of the instructional practices they were using, what students were doing in their class, what uh, we, we observed them doing in their classes. 
um, and and had a brief discussion with some of them. Um, we we sent the data to all of them, and then some of them we also met with um, to discuss the practices. So um, that was really neat. Yeah. Yeah. Julie, anything to add on that? I I think what was really interesting was and Bo's right was it was kind of fun when the faculty reached back to us and asked us they wanted to talk about their teaching. And then some of the people actually used with just a one page report, they actually put it yep. into the performance evaluation for the year so that it counted as data uh, to their department head about how they were doing new teaching. So we were pretty That's impressed. Quite with it. smart. Yeah. Was... And uh, so I think we kind of running out of time now. Is there any last burning question that anybody would like to um, ask? And um, I am conscious that a lot of people may have missed this talk because of the power going and the uh, network going down at Mamelodi, but we have recorded it. And so we'll be able to share it with them. So um, I don't think that Ntebuchin has made it back. Uh, so Janine, would you mind just uh, from the Mamelodi side, um, just saying one or two words before we close. Janine is the head of academic programs on the Mamelodi campus. Not sure if she's uh, managing. She might also be on the campus. So. Uh, it looks like she's. Uh, She's not managing to join us. OK, so then it's my job really to say thank you very much. I was fascinated by the way that you made the connection between how they taught and what they thought about the students, the connection between the teaching and learning. I thought that was and your framework is really quite interesting. And I'm, I think I do have one small question, and that is um, the TAs, the role of the TAs, and, and, and do you have a standard training for the TAs for this particular kind of work that you've been doing? That's a great question. And for one group, they did get um, that peer learning assistance group. Mm -hmm. They had um, a professional development group where they met monthly or so and got training on best practices in using TAs. Um, but the other groups, it could vary more broadly across them. Some certainly use TAs as um, essentially graders, which um, you know, perhaps not align with best practices. Um, but others, we definitely saw that enabled more group work where the instructor and the TAs, the TAs would be in class moving around and, and working one on one with groups of students. Um, while they were working on activities. So um, not across all these participants, um, certainly, but within some groups, there was at least um, some standardized uh, discussion on how to use TAs. OK, so uh, I'd say, like to say thank you very much for giving us your time so early in the morning, Bo. Uh, Julie, I think you're almost on our time. <laughs> so. <laughs> or exactly on our time or within an hour. So uh, and thanks very much for joining us from Switzerland. Uh, I hear you there and <laughs> I don't know if you're going skiing or anything. <laughs> but uh, um, and uh, thanks to everybody who managed to attend. And as I said, for those of you who missed out and perhaps uh, can pass this on to uh, others that there is a recording available. And thanks to Mabato for putting it, uh, putting up the, the site and so on. And um, I think that's the last one for this semester. And uh, we're looking for people, especially people who are teaching to do us. Uh, we have these ones about sharing practices um, and we'd like to hear from you and uh, what you do in your practices as an academic. So thank you very much, everybody, and see you next semester.
So, Bo, you can't be on the West Coast now if you got if it was 